Welcome to the Startup Leader Show, where we learn lessons from leading startup founders and executives. I am your host, Lisa Dreer, and I'm really excited to introduce our guest for today, Gary Kelnan. He is the CEO of Cis Lunar Industries. Welcome to the show, Gary. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Sure thing. Thanks for being here. Maybe we can start by having you give a little bit of background on yourself and sure. Cis Lunar Industries. Yeah, so um, my background, I really come from outside of the space industry, so I tend to be uh, a little bit of an outlier it, it, when, when I talk to people, but um, I come from a finance and startup background, had a startup right out of college, uh, first one in, in 20, 2001 to 2005, um, actually started while I was still a senior at, at, at CU Boulder, <laughs> but I've always had this fascination for space, and you know, after that startup, I kind of went into a more of a corporate type of role, did some finance and um, you know, fp and kind of stuff, budgets and that sort of thing. Uh, did some portfolio management. So I have my CFA designation uh, and, you know, got into with a, an asset manager here in Denver and sort of managed a bunch of strategies and, and that sort of thing. Went back into corporate finance. But all that time, I was really wanting to get into space and trying to find a path in that didn't require me to go back to school and become an engineer because that's what all the you know really interesting jobs look like they were. Um, and I found this institution called the International Space University which I'm not sure if you're familiar with, but uh, mm -hmm. I went there um, on their nine week you know, seminar program. Uh, when I did it, it was in Cork, Ireland. It goes to different cities around the world. Um, and it just brings together people from all over the space industry from all different backgrounds, too. I mean, everything from, you know, NASA propulsion engineers to dietitians and, you know, anything in between. And it's very international. But that was sort of my way of getting into the space industry and, and breaking into that. And when I did that, I actually left my job. Um, as a director of finance for for the you know the SaaS software company I was working at, at the time, and um, sort of I didn't burn my boats per se, but I did want to you know make a clean break um, because I really wanted to go and start a company uh, in the space industry that was sort of out on the frontier of human expansion into space and really be part of making an impact on on seeing humanity actually move sustainably beyond Earth because uh, that's kind of always been a dream of mine. I want to go to space someday. Um, and you know, I have a, a daughter, she's nine now, but when we start, when I went there, she was, I guess she was three at the time. Um, and I told her cause she wasn't happy about me leaving for so long. I, I told her, Hey, I'm going here because, you know, hopefully this will lead to something. And one day you and I can take a trip to the moon together. So we have this you know, sort of long, uh, goal for that, to, to make that a reality. And yeah, that's where I found my co-founders, um, uh, you know, who, who were interested in in building this idea, and we figured out what we were going to do there. So that's that's kind of where like my background feeds into the the background of of Sisler Industries, um, and then the concept that we created there, um, we 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 actually just kind of I, I wanted to be on the frontier of of human expansion. I had already kind of come to the conclusion that you know, resources were going to be key to being able to do that. You know, as a first fundamental building block. And uh, and so when we just went into a room on a whiteboard, it's okay, if resources are key, you know, what's the value chain look like? Where are the openings? And we saw companies at the time, this was 2017. Um, so, you know, planetary resources and deep space industries were really, you know, moving the needle and kind of making asteroid mining an actual thing, not just science fiction or, or you know, laying the groundwork, I should say. Right. Um, and then we had companies like Made in Space and Tethers Unlimited that were doing in-space manufacturing and a couple of companies talking about landing on the moon. And but really, everybody was talking about processing water and the key you know, value of water in space. But very few were really focused on how can we take the metal resources that would be extracted from these, res you know, these mining operations and use them for building industrial capabilities for with these manufacturers. And so we saw an opening there. I also learned about space debris. Um, at the time, I had known about it, I guess, but you know, only from things like Gravity, you know, the movie, and stuff like that. Yeah. I had a sense of it, but not the scale and exactly what it was, you know, the the, the nature of it. Um, and we just thought, like, hey, why is somebody mining the debris belt, you know, and figuring out a way to use that material? It's already up there; it's already refined metal, and we need to do something anyway. So we sort of crossed those two ideas: metal processing is going to be really important for building a resource economy. And, you know, asteroid or asteroids, uh, uh, space debris is a problem we need to deal with right now. So, yeah. you know, maybe we can put the two together, process space debris as the first metal feedstock, develop the technologies to be able to process metal in space. And then when the mined resources are available, we will already have, you know, the, the steel mills and the aluminum smelters of the future ready to go 
to kind of do the same thing for this next next industrial revolution that you know Andrew Carnegie did for the for the one in the last century. So that's that's kind of where we want to be with sister industries, metal processing in space to enable really a whole array of things. And there's a lot of things that come out of that. So we can dive into, you know, all the different aspects of that as, as we go. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So how far down the path are you guys in actually making this a reality? Yeah. So uh, the good news is we, we worked on this for a little while from 2017 to 2019, trying to do it in Luxembourg with their Luxembourg, uh, you know, resource uh, space resources initiative. Couldn't quite get full traction there. It was a bit early at that time. Uh, and then we came to the United States to move the company here in 2019. I'm, you know, U.S. born citizen, so we can do that and set up a, a company that's um, able to go after NASA funding. And in 2021, uh, we, we were able to win our first NASA SBIR. And that that really kicked us off to where we are today. So we did a phase one in 2021. We went all the way from concept to um, to, to working prototype that we demonstrated at Colorado School of Mines in October of 21, had a live audience it, there and in Australia with one of our partners, Neumann Space. We had Astroscale, Nanorax at that, at that event as well. And we sort of showed the whole value chain. Um, that was very successful. And then that led us to our phase two NASA um, SBIR, which we're currently working through right now. And we've already done a parabolic flight demonstration uh, back in November of the next version of our, of our foundry, which is we, it's a continuous casting, um, you know, microgravity foundry system. Um, and I can describe what continuous casting is for people. It's because not everybody knows what that means. But a lot of things that you think of that are things like the, the, the rails on a railroad, that sort of thing is made through continuous casting. The idea is you you pour molten metal into you know a, a, a vessel and molten metal flows into casting wheels. They have a certain shape when they come together. So if you look at that in the cross section, it makes whatever shape you want. And they freeze the shell of that metal as it comes through, it stays in that shape. And you can keep making something that's very, very long, you know, by just feeding more molten metal into it. Wow. That leads us to a lot of opportunities in space. And so we wanted to figure out a way to do that. Um, and that's what our, our core, you know, our core foundational capability is. Uh, and it, it's built off of technology that the NASA has been working on for decades, which is electromagnetic induction. And that in, in microgravity, you can use electromagnetic induction both to heat the metal and to um, to control its position. So if you think, I described what continuous casting is on Earth, it uses gravity, right? Yeah. In space, we have to figure out a way to replace that gravity component. So we're using electromagnetic um, induction to use magnetic fields to move that metal through the process. It kind of replaces the, the function of gravity in that case and does other things too, but. Wow, amazing. Yeah. We're, well, we're pretty far along on this. <laughs> Really exciting. That's just yeah. amazing. So it's been since 2017. Is that right? 2017 is when we first, you know, conceived the idea summer of 2017. Um, you know, we, we kicked it off with a proposal to Luxembourg in the fall of 2017. Uh, and it's evolved since then. Wow. Very exciting. Well, we invited you here today to talk a little bit about your experience in building Cislunar and perhaps some of your previous experiences as sure. well. Maybe you can start by talking a little bit about what some of the biggest keys to your success have been so far. Yeah, I mean, so it's been a windy road for us from where we started. Big idea, not a lot of knowledge about building a space company, um, you know, in 2017, just what we had learned and, you know, from the Space University and some of the experience of our co-founders who were also uh, experienced with startups. But um the key thing for me is is almost like a a dogged persistence, really, because we we there are many moments when we could have said this isn't really progressing, you know, like it's not the time isn't right. Let's just bag it and do something else. Um, but we kept seeing that this was going to be a key thing, and that this this industrial revolution was happening, um, and we just need to find a way to you know to get the capital and move things forward. So really being persistent, and then also having this like. Uh, some kind of North star. So for us, it was this, you know, for me, it's this, this desire to, I believe, I believe that the humanity moving beyond earth and taking advantage of the resources that are out in space um, is really the key to an abundant, prosperous future for humanity. This is the future I want for myself, though I want for my family and for everyone else, you know, uh, uh, in, in the world. And 
finding a way to impact that and help make that possible is is you know my personal driving force and kind of the underpinning force be behind sister industries. Um, and so we see the building the Space Foundry as a, as a key enabler of that. And yeah. so I think having something like that that carries you through you know those those difficult times that says okay. You can bounce off the hard point and say, is that still a real valid principle? If it is, are we still doing something that's going to help make that true? And can we do it in a reasonable amount of time? You know, or is the time just totally wrong? And we kept getting signals that, yeah, actually, you know, we aren't that far off. We just have to figure out how to do it. So yeah. persistence, having a, a North Star and, and then being flexible and figuring out ways to, you know, keep going, make it work. If everybody has to get a job temporarily to pay themselves so to, to live. Um, while we keep trying to move the needle forward, you know, with the idea, we've done that, you know, so mm -hmm. that, that all that stuff has been <laughs> at play until we got that first NASA um, contract and we were able to actually pay ourselves and, you know, start really doing more business. <laughs> Amazing. So what would you say is the most valuable business lesson that you've learned along the way? The most, so, I mean, there's a couple pieces of it. One is, um, if you're building a, an engineering startup or a technology startup, build something as soon as you possibly can. We actually didn't do that. Um, we did some other things that were important research, but you know th that that's definitely a valuable lesson. Um, but you know, having a key, like a team, a strong team that's that's with you, especially in the early days, you really I could not do this by myself. I, I absolutely need you know brothers and sisters in arms that that we can go to the trenches together and figure it out and lean on each other when we're feeling down or whatever. This has been a, a constant thread. And one of the things that I'm even learning now um, to do better, is, especially as we grow, is to leverage the people that we have more, you know, delegate more. This is always hard for entrepreneurs because you really want to try to do everything yourself, right? Yeah. But don't do that. Like if you can leverage your people and trust them and, um, you know, and, and develop that, that kind of trusting uh, everybody's in this together kind of ethos, then that's been one of the, the biggest things. Build stuff and have a strong team that you trust. Got it. So aside from building stuff quick, <laughs> more quickly, is there anything else that you would have done differently if you were to, I guess, start all over? I mean, that was the big thing. The other thing that that we did do um, that, you know, it was, it was instructive, but I think I would have done it differently is we went through some periods where we were a little bit uncertain about if we were on the right track. Uh, we were in a accelerator program and, you know, we were getting lots of different advice. Uh, this was in 2019 from different people. And, it, and, you know, we were also trying to find a market for these materials we were building. So there was a lot of things that fed into this, but you know, we got led down a, a, a bit of a detour from our primary purpose. And mm -hmm. we've gone through a few detours, whether it was listening to Luxembourg feedback and trying to tailor our thing for them or listening to advisors and trying to tailor our thing for what they thought was a good opportunity. Um, and the odd thing is we came back to what was more or less the original idea in a different form, in a much more plausible form in the way it is now than it was originally. But still, it was the same basic idea. Build a okay. you know, space foundry, process metal in space, and be that key piece of the economy. Um, I think sticking to that, you know, if you know that you've got to write the right concept, make sure you stay to that point there were other advisors who also told us to do that so <laughs> i it's you know it, it's always a question like it's time to pivot or not and uh, right yeah us, we would have been better off if we had stuck to that co common you know common principle from throughout mm -hmm. we learned yeah. from sometimes you don't know what you don't know though until you get there right so right. sometimes you try the path and go down it we did explore some different paths and actually another one that was interesting we uh even looked into like okay there's no market for this right now in space um, so this was like in 2019 time frame. you know, what about e-waste recycling? That's a problem. Maybe we could figure out how to do e-waste recycling and solve something on earth. Cause everybody wanted us to find terrestrial rev revenues. You know, yeah. Like, was a common thread back, at least back then. Um, and you know, we went down a very windy path with that one, but we explored it. Uh, we decided it wasn't the best business for us to be in, you know, at that stage. Mm -hmm. uh, but honestly, like if we hadn't done that, we might've decided to give it up at that time because it was really this crux moment like we got to keep doing something that keeps right. the ball moving forward and as soon as we got that nasa grant like ah, forget about space <laughs> with recycling <laughs> the real thing is the one we wanted to do all along so <laughs> excellent wow so i think that when we're starting out a lot of times we and 
maybe even beyond starting out, right? We run into these roadblocks along the way. What have you found are the most effective ways to work through or around those roadblocks? Yeah, I mean, well, like I said, we've had a lot of roadblocks, right? Um, I think the, the key thing is, you know, it's, it really comes back to the same thing that I've said already, or trusting your team and, and like having those people, figuring out who those people are that are going to be in and through thick and thin, um, you know, being persistent with your goals and, and sticking with it, but also being willing to talk to people outside. I mean, I think that has been a key, uh, you know, thing for us to move forward through different obstacles was being curious and always like going out to talk to people who might know something else or, you know, could give us different perspective on how we can get there. I mean, it's also what kept us focused on what we wanted to do because we got enough information for people that like thought, yeah, this is an important thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can make it work that it kept us on that right track. But, you know, if you stay in your, in your head and you're trying to figure everything else, like just while you're in spinning your wheels, just trying to sort everything out before you go out to talk to people, I think that can really, you know, sink you. If you're, in, if you're in the situation where there's a, a roadblock to get through, you got to yeah. be open, curious, you know, and, and go out and tell people what you're working on and what's, what's the challenges are. Right. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So what's next for Cislunar Industries? <laughs> yeah. So this is, uh, we're it, 2023 is shaping up to be a very exciting year. We're only three weeks into it. <laughs> um, but you know, we're, our, our current path for, for getting this technology to orbit in, in a real sense, um, has a couple different layers. The first, the key one is our core space foundry technology that we, we expect to bring to market in 2025. On the space station with a uh, metal processing on demand kind of service. So think of it as like any scrap metal that's not needed to send back down to Earth, or that you don't want to throw out the airlock, um, you know, and deorbit for because it's waste or something. Uh, we could recycle it on station and turn it into like say wire for 3D printing. And then there are other customers that will will you know use that material. So we have a, an LOI with with Axiom Space, um, and they're interested in in this idea of us. Um, doing this recycling as a service and handing the wire over to them and they have customers they want to sell it to. That is one example, but there's a lot of possibility there. We're doing our first demonstration on the space station in 2024. Um, and there'll be some announcements around that coming out soon. Um, and then there we have uh, another really big announcement that I can tease a little bit, but I can't tell much about it, unfortunately, but it will, it's definitely a huge strategic win for us. We'll be, um, you know, accelerating progress uh, towards, a couple of other key ideas we have, like building a salvage yard in space that uses, you know, metal-based propellant. Um, I, I didn't really talk about this much, but with our space foundry, we've talked about making materials to build stuff, right? That's kind of the obvious thing to do. We can also make metal propellant. And we worked with a company called Neumann Space out of Australia. They were in our first demo. And they make a propulsion system, the Neumann Drive, that can use solid metal propellant to, to propel things forward in an electric propulsion system. And that means that we can harvest propellant from the debris that needs to be collected. So there's a whole concept around, you know, bringing debris, equipping active debris removal spacecraft, like those that Astroscale makes, for example, um, and with this metal propellant drive, going out harvesting, you know, bringing that material to a platform that we are hosted on, which we're not building platforms, we're just building the foundry. So we'll rent those from other, you know, space station companies, mm -hmm. processing that portion of it into propellant to go out and get more stuff and then using the rest of that to either build propellant for other missions or to build larger structures on orbit or a whole array of possibilities that people want to do things like space-based solar power and lots of large like large space stations and interplanetary spacecraft like all these things should be built in space ultimately you know the, the large stuff yeah and, uh, and we can open up a lot of possibilities by producing that metal in orbit from you know the resources that we find out there whether they're man-made or they're you know natural. And then, then eventually, not that far off, we see going to the moon and setting up operations there as a, a huge opportunity. So oh. you know, I could go on and on about this. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's just time, but... amazing. So fantastic. It just it just truly amazing what you guys have done in in only you know a few years, really. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much for making time to be here today, Gary. I'm really excited to see what Cis Lunar Industries will, you know, continue to create and build. How do people learn more about your company? 
Yeah, so we're we're posting on LinkedIn pretty frequently. If you want to hear the announcements as they come out, that's the place to do it. Um, uh, so, you, you know, I, just look for Sistener Industries on LinkedIn or myself and you can find us. Um, and then we have a website, SistnerIndustries.com. Uh, and, you know, we, we will be needing to hire more people coming up here soon. So if, you know, if there are uh, engineers out there um, that want to get into space, and you know you don't have to be have a space background necessarily. I mean, we're we're interested in lots of perspectives. So, um, you know, let us know. <laughs> great, 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 great. Well, thanks again for being here today, and hopefully we can catch up again soon, and you can give us more updates. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Lisa. Thanks. <laughs>